Welcome to English for Engineers. I'm your host, Olivia Augustine. Join me on my podcast as I dig deep into all things technical English, business English, and international business communication to bring you a lifetime of knowledge in a digestible format. Today I'm so excited to have Arma here with me. Arma is not an engineer, but her weapon of choice is, if I might say so, is the English language. Arma has an international background regarding her personal life and she's also worked with people from a vast number of different cultures. I appreciate her so much because she has an analytical mind, is straightforward, and even though she doesn't mince words, she's always kind. And our working title for recording this episode is Lost in Translation. But Arma, I throw it over to you. Why don't you introduce yourself a bit? Thank you so much for having me. I'm really excited to be here. So my name is Amaz Barcha. I am, I'm a legal expert, but um, I had a kind of weird introduction to law. So I have an undergraduate degree in economics, and I um, was studying in the United States at the time. And um, I, I came to London for a semester abroad. And during that time, I had an internship in a, in a legal department for a very large multinational corporation. And that's when I was first introduced to law. Um, I went back to the US, I finished my degree in economics, I got a job there. Um, and then uh, about a year and a half later, I got a phone call from my old boss in London saying, hey, do you, do you want to come work for me? I'm creating a new position on my team. I want you to come work for me. Um, you have to move to London, but I'll pay for law school. So I said yes. And uh, three weeks later, I was on a plane, and I moved to London. And um, I started law school in London while working full-time in a corporate legal department. And um, three months later, the boss that I came here for left the company. But I did finish law school. Um, <laughs> I have a graduate and a postgraduate degree in English law. Um, and then I, I left the company two and a half years later, I think, um, and started my own company doing consulting for large legal departments because um, I wanted to help more than just a single company. Um, so that's my background. Um, what I forgot to mention in there is that there were some visa issues uh, moving into the UK, um, being from the US. Um, but luckily, I'm born in Romania, and I have Romanian citizenship as well. So I came over as an EU citizen. Um, so then, you know, my background is Romanian, American, and now British. Wow, that is exciting, quite exciting. So you also have all three passports? I do, as of about three months ago. How cool is that? So you are an American, a European citizen, because Romania, and you're British. I, I think Britain's actually part of Europe. I know it's not part of the EU, but it is part of Europe, right? So, Okay, yeah, yeah, right. I was talking about the <laughs> EU. My bad, my bad. So how was that culture-wise? Because people may think, yeah, she's moving from the United States to Great Britain, from the US to the UK. Maybe you have to adjust your pronunciation a bit, say trousers instead of pants, and that's about it. It's the same language. English is English, isn't it? It is and it's not. Um, it's funny, when I came over as an intern, as a student with a, a set deadline, I was here for three months. I ended up staying another three, but that's another story. Um, but I came with a, with a deadline and I came over and I worked in, in a British company, you know, British headquartered company and with Brits and with people from all over the world because, you know, that's how big companies are. Um, and I felt like I had assimilated. I felt part of the culture. I spoke English. They spoke English. It didn't feel like a big deal. Now, when I came back with no end date, it felt like a completely different situation because suddenly I had to assimilate. I had to adapt. I wasn't just a visitor anymore. And English is not just English. There are cultural differences. There are nuances in the way people speak. Even saying the same sentence can have a completely different meaning because the Brits have a different cultural interpretation of it. Oh, can you give us an example? That, that sounds potentially confusing. Absolutely. So um, my first uh, Secret Santa. Do you do Secret Santa? I do you know what that I is? I know what it is, but to be honest, I have no idea if they do that in the Netherlands. I do know that it's done in grammar school in Austria. So I'll just explain briefly. So, you you know, everyone's name, this was in the office, so everyone's name in the department went into a pot and then everyone, you know, drew a name out of the pot. 
um, and that was your secret person that you're supposed to get a secret gift for for Christmas. And you know, it, it's it's just a jokey thing. It doesn't have to be a serious gift. Usually, there's a ten pound euro limit kind of thing. It's not a you know, it's not a big thing. It's just something fun for the office. And um, the re- the gift I received was English humor for beginners. Oh no! <laughs> yes. That was my reaction as well. Um, I did figure out who gave it to me too, but um, <laughs> that, that doesn't really matter. Um, but one of the first things I learned from one of my colleagues through that book actually um, was that if you say it's completely my fault, in American, that means it's completely my fault. I made a mistake. I'll fix it. Um, and I say that, you know, I, I used to say that all the time because, I, you know, people make mistakes. It's fine. Um, apparently, if you say it to a, a British person, it means it's completely your fault and Oh, vice versa. So I sat there thinking, oh my, for the last few months, because I, I think I moved over in April. You thought you were humble and reasonable, but you insult people all the time. I might have been. I'll never know now. But that, that's one of the cultural differences, right? You, you say this the exact same sentence and it means something the complete opposite of what you meant. Wow. So how do you solve that intrinsic challenge? What's your workaround? Or did you adapt British English 100%? A little bit of both. It's really important to be aware of it in the first place and be aware of that once it happens once, you know it could happen with other things and you just don't know. And it's important to know what you don't know. So I will never be one of them, one of the Brits. I've been a foreigner all my life because I moved to the United States as a Romanian when I was four years old. So I've learned to adapt to these sorts of situations. And one of the things I do is whenever I introduce myself to someone new, I never do it by email. I always pick up the phone and let them hear my voice. Because especially here in the UK, if they hear an American accent, their perceptions change. They become accepting of things that they might not have been otherwise. They understand, oh, you're not part of my culture. What you say might mean something different than I expect. Oh yeah, very smart to call them. I do something similar because if I'm speaking Dutch, it can take about five to 10 minutes for people to realize that I'm not Dutch on a good day that it's not my mother language. So very much in the beginning, I try to sneak in something like, oh, how do you say the word in Dutch? Or simply tell them that I'm an expert. And then they are aware that there might be grammar mistakes or cultural mistakes popping up along the way. What you just said about calling people first is actually a good tip for my podcast listeners, my engineers whose mother language is not English uh, and they have international projects introduce yourself something like that's not my mother language maybe there might be different perceptions of what i say i really try not to be rude i'm just coming from a very direct culture and that's a great introduction i mean after all we we think of companies but we're working with people we're working with humans every company is made out out of humans and we understand that there are other people in the world and you know sometimes americans forget that but um you know, um, it's, it's really important to remember that other people are, are just people too. And if you introduce yourself in that way, they'll understand that, you know, you're doing your best or you don't mean to insult someone. And that's really important. Yeah, very much true. So when you go visit family in France back in the States, do they still see or perceive you as an American or do they say, oh, you're so British? They do say that, actually. Um, I don't, I mean, in terms of my family, I don't know if they ever saw me completely as American. Yes, I grew up there, but I grew up in a in a Romanian-American household. We spoke Romanian at home, but we speak about things like school and work always in English because that's a vocabulary now. We just don't have, you know, after so many years, we don't have the vocabulary in Romanian to speak about those things because words change, mm-hmm. language evolves, um, especially me because I was so young. Um, I can speak about cooking in Romanian quite easily because I always did, but I can't speak about work or school or, you know, various other topics in Romanian. So they do notice the change in my accent. So Brits will will say, you're American, you have an American accent. They might say, you have a soft American accent, which I've heard a few times because it doesn't sound as harsh. Um, I think my accent is still almost 100% American, but my intonation has changed. The the ups and downs of how I speak has adapted more to the British way. That said, because I speak multiple languages, um, I speak Romanian, I speak English, but I also speak French and Spanish, and I've learned a little bit of Japanese and Korean. 
Um, but because of that, I adapt to my audience a lot. It's, um, it's called mirroring. So when I hear a certain speech pattern, I tend to mirror it. So the longer I'm in the US, the more American I start to sound. And then when I come back to the UK, I, I, I shift a little bit back to more of the British accent. But it's funny, the first time I went back after living here permanently, so it, it had been maybe six months of living in the UK, working here, um, I was just you know at the checkout in a, in a grocery store. And this woman behind the, the checkout says, oh my gosh, are you from England? And I said, oh my gosh, I'm not. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and the longer you hang out with me, you probably even get an Austrian accent as well. You never know, I might. Ama, I have another question for you. We both are really, really big fans of the book The Culture Map by Erin Meyer. We both love it. It's such a great book. It's such a great resource that helps you navigating the minefield of international business relations. And there's one example I read, and that example is the base for my next question. Let me paint the scene or paint a picture, set the scene for you. It's an international project. The engineers involved are German and Japanese. And uh, due to the nature of different time zones, most communication is via email. The Japanese engineer has a question that he emails to his German counterpart. The German technician knows the answer and immediately replies, problem solved, you would think. The other way around, whenever the German guy has a question for his Japanese counterpart, it takes sometimes even up to a week until he gets a reply. And here's the trouble. Both of them assume that the other one is not doing their work properly or diligently. Why? Compared to Japan, Germany has an egalitarian culture, to ask what Japan is more hierarchical. Even if you know the solution to a problem, you go and double check with your boss. And that takes a day or two. So the longer response times are perceived by a German as slow, as not knowledgeable. The other way around, the fast response of the very knowledgeable German is perceived as hasty or lazy by his Japanese counterpart. A fast response means you did not check with your boss, which could mean you're a lazy or b you don't respect your superiors. The problem is thus not a grammar problem, it's not a language problem, not even a technical problem, there was a cultural misinterpretation of behavior. They were lost in translation. So my question is for you, the question that I started feels like five minutes ago, is there a difference between the US and the UK as how they handle projects and project communication? Absolutely, that's the short answer. The short answer, yes. Okay, but let me just stop you there because I want to save the long answer for the next episode of this podcast when Amar Sparcher and I are going to continue our conversation about the minefield of international business communication. That was it for today, my friends. This was English for Engineers. I'm your host, Olivia Augustin. Talk to you soon.